I am unashamed. What about you? Welcome back to Unashamed. Um, Dad, what's going on down there on the on the river these days? I'm down here in Alabama, so I'm missing out fighting on all the, the fighting the beavers. Beavers. Beaver fights. Every day we get up and we go over. We've had a little bump in the river. Some rains up north of us in Arkansas. That affects the water level down here. And uh this has been a summer of it it just seems to hang on a little bit. The rivers the river at pool stage, locks and dams has got it dammed up, you know, the US Army Corps of Engineers. The twenty one two is what they call it. That's the level. And uh it fluctuates from twenty one two to about fifty rising. You'd imagine people yep. who live in or along the Washita River. I mean, you have to be ready to deal with the water that goes from 20 feet to 50 feet, a 30-foot rise. Well, 30-foot yep. rise, no matter how far you are from the river, if you can see the river and it rises 30 feet, you better, you're better going to need some hip boots or waders. <laughs> <laughs> it floods where you the- park your vehicles. <laughs> I mean, it's a current right there in your yard. There's Sounds cotton like mouth. you need a boat. Need a boat. Yeah, we, we got a boat. We go to the left there. We, most of the time, we just walk around the top of the hill. But dealing with floodwaters for the last, uh, we moved in here in the 70s. So that's where all the duck calls were built and commercial fishing took place. Now it's just kind of walk out on the porch. You see the river coming, but it it's real simple. You just move back from it. It keeps coming <laughs> till, it, till it quits it rising, and then you say, "Well, we beat another one." Yeah, <laughs> we're used to flood. We're raised in floodwaters. I like yeah. the simplistic idea, though, because everybody's like their hair's on fire. That's what are we going to do about the planet? What are we going to do about this? Dad's philosophy is just just step back. Just just it's you know, basically whatever's ha- <laughs> just survive. The beavers just survive. Are, the beavers are there, <laughs> and they want to hold the water in there. I have not been able to convince them that they need to get out of my way and not try to dam up what I'm trying to drain back into the river. It's a power <laughs> struggle, Phil. Huh? It's a power struggle. It's a power struggle, and the in the in the and a beaver. If you study him, you could just take a beaver, study him for years, and you will come up with one 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 uh, uh, stream of thought. There is a God. <laughs> well, I was to say, just watch it, the beavers. We believe you're going up against what the Almighty wired into them. The evolutionists would say you're working against millions of years of evolution when you're fighting the beavers. That but is I correct. Think you're up against you're up against the Almighty. What a varmint! But it's the same principle. I mean, my dog. He yeah. You, know, you read that verse in Peter where it says. You know, it'd be better for you not to even know the way of righteousness than you know than to know it and turn your back on it. And then it, there's an illustration there. It says like a dog returns to his vomit. Yep. You're worse off at the end than you were at any point. And so you're like, well, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you're you, know, you see dogs do that. So my dog, when I first got this dog, old biggin. The guy that had him, because he had him as a field trial dog, and but he just said there was a he has a screw loose, and I was like, well, what what would you, how would you describe the screw being loose? What what what? How would you describe that attitude? And I remember him saying this. He said, well, he has a rebellious spirit, and what I've noticed is about once every three or four weeks, he's just determined to leave the premises. So I think I shared that before. Yeah, you and, talked about it before. Because look. The, you got loose in your neighborhood. Yeah, the day before, we had the little one with us. And uh, we had the most fun ever because I tried to teach this dog. The, uh, our, the little boy was throwing golf balls in a swimming pool, which I was like, well, you know, i got to get all these out. But this, you know, when you throw something, this dog thinks, well, here, you know, they're doing this for me. And so it was funny to watch the dog. He didn't understand that this golf ball is under the water because he saw it go in the water. Mm -hmm. He sees it, but he can't get it. And so we're laughing 
because he's trying to submarine and he won't leave the pool because he's like, I see it, but I can't get it. And so then, you, you know, you throw another one in there and here we go. It's same day. So we laugh, you know, big times. Everybody's bonding. Well, the next day I let him out and my neighbor kind of hollered at me like, hey, Jason. And I, when I looked up at my neighbor and looked back down, the dog was gone. He was at my feet and this dog weighs almost 100 pounds. Jason, at some point. I know of your story is, I don't know how long it is. Yeah. But at some point, you, you have to start realizing <laughs> you have a dumb dog. <laughs> well, maybe so. <laughs> so I look up, I can't find the dog. And uh, so nine hours later, after about the 10th or 12th trip in my truck through the neighborhood, way away from my property, I turn a corner. And he's in the middle of somebody's yard, and, and the, there's no vehicles there. And he had taken everything they had had under that carport and destroyed it. Uh. But now it was mostly junk and, and paper and trash. <laughs> as far as you know. <laughs> but it was worse after he left. Yeah, so I did the best I, I could. I'm apologizing. So if how much know. did that cost you? I mean, how much? <laughs> no, I just cleaned it up but and act like I wasn't there. But <laughs> here was the funny part. When I got out of that vehicle, well, he looked up at me. It's been nine hours. And he's like a little kid. He didn't realize, you know, I need it's hot. I need to take a drink. You know. Does this, he do this. anything good? Yeah, he's a good retriever some days. But when he has the rebellious spirit, it's, that's why I brought up it's like a dog. He, he, he just so, – so when I saw him, I thought he's going to be relieved that I have rescued him. I'm going like spiritual mode now. This is, you know, cue the music, chariots <laughs> of fire. He runs toward me, you know, because the last time, I, you know, I, I extended more discipline, but I thought, no, nope, I'm just going to give him grace. He'll be happy. He sees me. And just takes off running down the middle of the road, just wide open. And I'm, I had my whistle, which he responds to the whistle. I blew that whistle. No, <laughs> he just. And then I thought, I guess this dog don't love me anymore. You know, this this relationship is over. So I get in the vehicle <laughs> and I drive down there, and I'm like hollering at him, like, you know, whoa, stop, sit, <laughs> blowing the whistle, and he finally stopped. You know, then he's looking all depressed, you know, like I'm, you know, I messed up, loaded him up in the truck and took him. And that was yesterday. So today I let him out and he was as happy and obedient and he never left my side. You know, so I, I just don't know what to do. It's a it's a pattern that happens every few weeks. He just says, I'm out of here. Well, good luck with that. If he's go get your ducks or bring them to you. Well, that's one. I have two that are being trained right now, Labrador retrievers, and both of them have uh, have uh, they they he, the trainer said they're doing well. So I'll be getting those in. Jace, you you don't might not realize it, but the the September's coming up rapidly. Yeah, I know. I mean, the teal. July, will... August, September. So in about the teal in our area starts showing up about mid-August. That's right. Despite the heat. Doesn't make I mean, any they difference. just show up. They go so. into the Yucatan in Mexico. Yeah. So that's that's exciting. Well, and they don't uh I mean, your your dogs that are the the blues offspring, right? That that's are right. being trained. The yeah. offspring so, full blue. So maybe they're a, a little kind, kinder, gentler blue. Yeah, well, Burley seems, uh, you know, we had Burley on a podcast a couple podcasts ago, and he he was, I could tell, he had a confident view of the offspring of blue, so we'll see. Yep, we'll see. So we're in Luke chapter 9. Today. 9, yeah. We finished up yep. chapter 8 on the last podcast with the um, – we had the two miracles. Um, actually, we, we spent a couple of podcasts talking about uh, that. It was pretty amazing because you had the the child who was dying. And so en route uh, to the child, 
Jesus also encountered a woman who had uh, 12 years of bleeding. So we talked about that in the last podcast, which gets us to uh, chapter 9. By the way, since you're there, uh, it is worthy of note. I'm not quite sure of the why, but uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he goes, each writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they have a complete historical record. Jesus, who he is, through him everything was made, John said. They all have their idea of that. But, but Jesus himself, you go halfway through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and each one of them about halfway through is when he begins to say, I'm going to die, be buried and raised from the dead. He's going to announce the gospel verbally in the middle. It's coming up. See, we're in Luke 9, where we're about midway in the book of Luke. It's about 24 chapters or so. But about halfway through, he begins, the drumbeat begins. uh, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer many things. He always mentions who's going to do the killing. The man of the, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He's putting the blame where it is on the most religious people on the face of the earth. I just think it's worthy of note. That well, because somebody misses, well, you know, the gospel, and they, they, they start telling you stuff. And I said, no, but you're not saying what Jesus said. We're we're centric. We're 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 zeroing in on his death, burial, and resurrection. Then, adios. Didn't stay but a month and gone. Yeah, I mean it's it's really amazing. And that's actually where we'll get there in this chapter, Dad. Is he, yep. he he's going to have that conversation, and then you're going to see a shift when that happens because then he's on the road to Jerusalem, and it all starts kind of running downhill. And he ties it into the kingdom throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tie it to the kingdom. I tell you the truth, just below when he announces, I'm going to die, I tell you the truth, some who are standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Well, that sounds like... Well, that's in 27. That's in Luke 9, 27. Yeah, that that sounds like Mark over there in Mark 9, 1. You know, he just said the same thing. They begin to spread the news that the kingdom and Jesus dying, being buried and raised, both it works together throughout the Gospels. If you you just look at it, you'll tie it all together. But I think we're at a point where to try to make sense on why he set this up the way he did. This is the perfect place to be reminded of that. That's why, but, I, that's why I just gave that little speech. Yeah. But I'm saying the stuff before he did. I mean, I, I got to thinking last night when I was reading this, you know, he sends out these 12 and he gives them power. This is Luke nine, one yep. and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. See, it's and, all been on him. Till about right along in now. Well, right. But it made me realize, too, that these miracles that he was doing was pointing, like we said last podcast, that that he's the son of God. God has come down. And that should make it beyond beyond doubt. Yeah. But when you think about the types of miracles he did and why he's doing this, because he's giving you the redemptive story. Even in the miracles, because you think about it, he didn't do any miracles for himself. It, it wasn't like he was making his life easier or, and he wasn't doing miracles. You just think about all the great marketers in our world today. If somebody was drawing up a marketing scheme on how God was going to prove to the world that he was the son of God, I mean, look, with, you would have him, you know, Going airborne and throwing oh. fireballs at oh. you know you 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 wouldn't have like him feeding the five thousand which we're going to get to with some bread. I mean, you would have like him going some kind of uh, what was the things in Star Trek the holodecks or whatever where you could enter yeah. a different world. You you could have him all of a sudden 
just give a picture and have all yeah. this fine restaurant out in the in the middle of nowhere oh, with yeah. waiters, you know, carrying around stuff. And you're just like, well, this is just <laughs> this is amazing. So I know people- basically, basically, <laughs> Jace, you would have a Marvel movie. Let's uh, let's take our first break. So we love uh, doing our podcast for you guys. The feedback we get is amazing. And there's a lot of great podcasts uh, that are out there other than Unashamed. And one of those is a brand new one we're super excited about uh, called Refocus with our old friend Jim Daly uh, from Focus on the Family. And never forget the first time that Lisa and I went out to do their radio show uh, with Jim and John and just sitting down and talking with uh, Jim in his office. You know, I'd never met him before we were about to go on air. And I was just so comforted by the fact of him willing to tell a story, very practical, very personal. And so I'm not surprised that he's got a great podcast. I think, Dad, you and I are going to be a guest on that coming up pretty soon. Uh, Jim is the president of Focus on the Family. Uh, They've been a great Christian organization for over 40 years. They've been in the trenches, uh, one of the great advocates for families in America. Uh, he's been the president uh, for 20 years, uh, so he's got great resources. Talk to his, his reach is millions of people. Uh, on the Refocus podcast, Jim's going to talk with a lot of guests like us uh, about what's going on in our culture, about woke politics, about all the things that are out there this day. So check out Refocus with Jim Daly on Spotify, on Apple, or anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. Refocus with Jim Daly. Exactly. And so you think, well, why didn't he do that? Why didn't he do selfish miracles or why didn't he do things uh, that were so crazy or like a magician style where he's he's saying, look, there's nothing. I have nothing on on my body. And then all of a sudden, you know, you pull out a tank, you know, from thousands of years later. And and, and, (laughs) he could have done that. Can if you can manipulate the atoms and the molecules, you can manipulate the atoms and the molecules. There, there's no limit to what you could do. I mean, you, you could be. We've every- already said it, it. We've already said he wasn't bound by time. So, however long time goes on, anything within time was at his disposal to use at any time during time. Yeah, he so. could have done every magic trick in the history of magic tricks for real. Yeah. <laughs> And you that have written books about it. And so you think, well, why when you start looking at what he does, well, it's all it's all a a shadow of what he's gonna do for redemption of mankind. Cause you think about it, a lot of people think, well, he's doing things that are that are supernatural. But I would contend that the miracles that he is doing is showing you how it should have been. When you think when God first created the earth, there was no disease, there was no uh, sickness, there was no pain. It was, so so all he does by the miracles he's doing is showing you how it was, look, and how it's going to be. And everything he does, one thing after the other, to put it just simply, is good. It's good. It's There's good. no, look, no, he's driving out evil spirits. He's healing diseases. He's helping the lame. He's, uh, you know, feeding people. Uh, what He's taking a storm and calming it. It, it. Everything he's doing is showing you a natural Chase, the world word is, is paradise. The word, the, word, the word is restoration. He's showing you a restored Cleaning process. out evil spirits. He's against evil. That's right. And the spirits. He cleans them out, cleans them out, gets rid of them, gets good of them. So in this case, he's actually showing. Plus conquered death, uh, Jay. Yeah. He's conquered death here. Exactly. Raise the girl. Uh, yeah. Raise the girl from the dead. Nobody's dying. There's no pain. There's no tear. But he's showing you how that once was and how it can be. So, so when you see that he's preparing people for the kingdom, that's how he's bringing faith, hope, and love. That's right. And he's also here in this, in this instant, he's showing that flawed people, even though they don't, they don't even get who he is and how he's going to do it completely, and they have doubt, he's going to use them to, to show his power and give them the ability to do this. Which So you fast forward to that. What do we do now? Post spirit being poured out, well, we have the Holy Spirit. 
we go around and we're being broken so that other people may experience his power and you redemption. You would think that the that the from the, when he sent out the 12 that he was training you would kind of expect more from them. And because, and and especially none of them would probably run out on you if you now you you have the ability to to perform miracles and all. You I would, would be thinking. You would think, but, I am with the but right. But it doesn't work. It I'm doesn't with the work, right man. These days, the miracles simply will not it not work. It, it will not work. They they didn't understand what he was. This upside down uh, power program, I guess, that he was bringing. That's the exact opposite of the kingdoms of the world. That if you want to be great, you got to be humble. And if you want to, you know, they they just didn't. They just couldn't see it. But he's he's drawing them a picture about how this new kingdom is going to be. And I think if you look at it like that, that there was a redemptive purpose behind what he was doing, that he was preparing their hearts, that one day they would put all the pieces together and, and see what the real kingdom of God is. Yep. So... I mean, what, you agree, Al? Yeah, I think that's a great. I think that's a great illustration, and and I hadn't thought about it before both what was and what will be. I, I like that idea of his miracles being restorative or, or restoration in nature. You mentioned that he gave them two things: he gave them divine power and divine authority. And my assumption is this was temporary for the mission because we don't seem to see this later until they get the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you know, in the day of Pentecost. And so this seems to be almost just like a test run for the disciples, like a little, okay, I'm going to send you boys out. Yeah. You know, I'm going to give, I'm going to give you the two things you need, divine power, divine authority. One of the guys I was reading, Jace had a illustration of a, which I thought was pretty good. He said, this is like a, a police officer who, you know, the, 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 uh, red light is out, so he's having to direct traffic, which normally that wouldn't be his job. But when he's standing there underneath the red light, you got all these cars around him. He's got a gun. He's got the power to stop anybody that that he needs to, and he's got the authority. He's got a badge that says even if he held up his hand and says stop, a two thousand pound vehicle has to stop, or you face the government. And I thought that was a pretty good illustration that Jesus has given them divine power and authority to accomplish what he needs to, only again to point them to the kingdom. Yeah, but therein you can see a little opening and in, 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 on why they didn't do better than they could have. Nine forty six, chapter nine, an argument started among the disciples. Uh oh, as to which of them. <laughs> would be the greatest. You know, they're, they're sitting there arguing about, okay, look, it's just 12 of us, and they're jockeying for position to see which one would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child, and he had him stand before him, and he teaches them a lesson there. But you would think grown men wouldn't be arguing about who's going to be the bulldog here and who's not going to be, who's going to be the greatest here. And if you're sitting there arguing about that, it does slow your progress down. Well, and it, it and it brings it it brings up an interesting point, Dad. J Jesus sends them out on this little sortie, this little test run. Yeah. Obviously, they're and they're not fully even aware of what the kingdom is yet. We know that because when he was leaving, they were still asking about restoring the kingdom. So it does give me a little bit of hope that Jesus uses us when we're not all the way ready. Yep. And yet he he lets he puts us out there anyway because. Otherwise, you're right. If he had to wait till they got it all figured out, they'd never go anywhere. Yeah. Well, I think it also shows you the point I made for a couple of podcasts because he had called the 12. Well, Judas was one of them, and it just shows you that God uses people who are not believers to to actually have gifts. There's some of them right here. Distributed. You remember the story in the Old Testament, uh, Balaam or whatever. It, it was yeah. the same principle that some people have gone around and been able to, you know, show the the gifts, and their heart been a million miles away from the Lord. That's why we're we're leading to this is revealing the character of God, 
And when the Holy Spirit comes out and is made available, and this is 1 Corinthians 13, which was just a bombshell chapter to the Corinthian church, because he's like, you're so obsessed with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you missed the gift yep. and the fruits yep. of the Spirit. And, you know, he has that if you can do all these miracles and fathom all mysteries and do all this. Now but, they're but you have not which one did the greatest miracles. Y'all know why you was asleep. I'll tell you what I did. Well, exactly. You remember the time when we were out there? and he, they, they... Well, Luke 10, look, the next cha- when we get to the next <laughs> chapter, he sends out 72, and he gives them the same power. And guess what? Same things ha- happen. He, they come back, and it says they're jumping up and down with joy yeah. because the demons submit to them. And, he, and Jesus slapped them on the wrist and said, don't be excited about that. Be excited that your names are written in the book of life. Yeah. Which shows you that you, you, and I think about it in life, you know, really everyone, the gifts that we have, I mean, you can make, stretch this principle where it says every good and perfect gift comes from above and we're made in the image of God. And we all have gifts even in that, that God has given us just in life to function. Because if, if we didn't, if if you didn't have these gifts from God, well, the, this planet wouldn't even survive, you know, a year. I mean, there are, yeah. there are people who are not, that don't have a relationship with God that are using their gifts from God from the beginning to make the world a better place, and you see it. That doesn't mean their names are written in the book of life, but it just makes the earth able to function. I mean, now, even if you go to an inner city, you're not going to last long, you know, without somebody trying to knock you in the head. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that's God's plan, and it, it's it's a sign that leads us to God. I mean, there's a hunger. I think we're going to see this when we get to the uh, him feeding the 5,000, that we all have towards God because you you look around and you're like, this can't be the end of this. I mean, there's got to be something more. And even even deep down, I think there is a draw to that. But I think Jesus is giving us a picture here in this context that he can use you and you can do, you know, great things. But at some point, there has to be a humbling of the heart and soul to who Jesus is, which is why his death, burial, and resurrection is coming, and that's really the heartbreaker for people. No, I think you're right, Jason. I think that's why this is, to me, this episode here is almost like just a little temporary sortie. It's like he wants them to feel what it's going to feel like to have this power in this moment, but also to try to keep them focused on what they're supposed to be doing because they do it. I mean, they preach the kingdom. Let me read the rest of this text. You read the first two verses. So he he sends them out to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. And he tells them, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. So, I mean, literally, he wants them going stripped down. I mean, we're, we're traveling light. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, he means in the town, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town as a testimony against them. So they set out, went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. So they basically did exactly what he called them to do. And I think the the reason that he does this is to it's just a little moment in time to prep them for what's coming, because I, I don't even think they held on to these powers past this event. I mean, I, the Bible doesn't say that, but I'm assuming they don't because they don't have it later until they, well, right, the because he was giving them an idea that you're going to have to rely on my power. To yeah, do which is the whole point of yeah. not taking anything, right? I mean, because that's the, they had had some of those things traveling with him, so he's obviously saying, I don't want you taking anything that you rely on yourself. You've got to completely rely on God. Well, that's this why process. I think it's confusing because then when people say they went around preaching the gospel, usually when we say the gospel, we're talking about what Phil introduced, you know, earlier in the podcast, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But he hadn't died yet. He he's not been resurrected. That's why you can't have the gospel without Jesus being the Son of God and becoming a human. And this is a great illustration of that. They're pointing people to a new king. The kingdom is near. 
here are the principles of it, and it's all those things that you read in the Sermon on the Mount, Luke 6, that it's it's better to be poor in spirit and you know, all the humble, and even though you, it's going to be difficult and in tears, and there is there is a new order, and the, the king is here. So that's what they're preaching, and, and they're telling them to repent. When you look at the other gospels yeah. in this their message was repentant change the way you think change the way you operate that and so you realize how difficult that's going to be for them to get out from under a law based system because these people were all thinking you know if i obey and i really believe in god he's going to accept me but jesus is coming with a new concept, which is going to be God accepts you, therefore I obey, <laughs> which is what he's laying the groundwork for in what's going to happen on the cross. I do think it's interesting, Jace, because you and I have been on, you know, mission trips through the years. There is something powerful about experiencing a short term mission where you're in, you're outside of your comfort zone, you're outside of your culture, you're outside of the things you know. And you're going there for one purpose, and that's to talk about Jesus. And it, and it, it it does something to you. It, it takes away a lot of times your inhibitions and the things that hold you back, and it, and it puts you in positions where you'll jump in where you wouldn't normally do that. I mean, we're all finicky eaters, right? We, we we're funny about that. But when I go on a mission trip, I'm not thinking about any of the things I like about culture. My what I like to watch on TV, what I like to eat, nothing. I mean, I'm there for these people. I'm usually in some scenario or situation, which I would never do at home, but it's something about the mindset. So I, I do think there's something about that that's like there's a power in that. And Jesus is like he wants them to experience that without him being there to sort of provide that little comfort place of them knowing he's going to be the guy. I mean, wouldn't you have you experienced that, Jason? Your yeah, I mean, look, studio? when I was a teenager, I was went off to – some group, you know, mission trip, and we were in the United States. Well, we went to New York City, and somebody had the idea at about day three or four that we should just go do some street preaching. Of course, I was pretty shy back then, and I was like, well, I don't want to do that. Nobody's going to listen. I had all these doubts, which I really think is the theme of this whole paragraph. I think that Jesus was trying to plant the seed that you're, I know this is going to be difficult. I know you're going to have doubts about this. This doesn't make sense, but you need to trust me. And I think you see the story of him sending them out. And then you're going to see uh, when Herod, uh, he's mentioned that he had the same doubts and had an opportunity really to, to change his family and the course of where he was headed. And he chose poorly but I remember when I went out there and I thought, I'm going to do that. In that moment, did the people, I, I felt. Did well, the people welcome you that you were? Uh, some did. But I, I'm, to Al's point, in that moment, I really had a lot of doubts, you know, personally and individually that I'm like, this is not going to work. And, you know, I was nervous. And, and I just opened my Bible and started talking. Well, I was shocked that people would stop, and they would listen. And some of them would move on, some of them stayed, and then you're right. Then some people came up there. New York and, and needs, were like, needs Blank to call y'all back up there. Blankety, 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 you're a blankety, 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 blankety. You know, so for a young man, it just was, you know, I think it was, it was more for me realizing that this is not going to be easy. This seems crazy. There's a thin line between what I'm doing right now and the guy who's been drinking all night that has the sign over there that says the end is near. You know, I mean, it, it really it seems crazy. But what I was amazed at and what has carried me through, when you start sharing Jesus and the principles that he is presenting, it does stop people in their tracks and it may make them mad, but it makes some people sad and it makes some people glad, but it makes people do something yeah. because it's questions that he answers that, that the world just, they don't have an answer for really, if you're being rational and open-minded. So, 
Yes, I've noticed it in other countries too, but that one sticks out more because it, it wasn't something I was really comfortable with, but I did it. And I think I could understand how they felt because I thought this is a terrible idea. And it, it seemed to bear no fruit. I went uh, to New York City and I felt like I was in another world. Yeah. Another part of the world. Well, it's a melting pot. Let's take another break. But I, so that's my point is I think there was a lot of this was purposed in what they were going to accomplish. And so I think that yeah. was part of this purpose and plan. I do want to mention one thing when he told him to, when you go to a house, stay there until you leave. And this is another thing, just in my experience, that you always need a base of operations because, you know, we've been in situations before you don't need to move around too much in some of these cultures. I mean, it's a little bit dangerous. And, you know, there was in this particular culture they were in, and it's still this way to, to, to today, by the way, that in Eastern culture, when you go into a person's house, I mean, it's more than just, hey, you're our guest. You are protected there. Like they would defend you against whoever, anybody tried to hurt you. There, There's these rules of hospitality that mark Eastern culture. They're a lot different than us. Like somebody shows up and says, hey, bring that guy out. You're like, no, you, you see a little bit of that, what happened with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. But it's interesting. I read uh, I read Marcus Luttrell's book years ago, Lone Survivor, and that's really what saved Marcus's life because he was injured and he wound up in a house wherever he was at in some village in Afghanistan. And because he was there, they protected him like the Taliban was after him. Everybody knew they were looking for him. I mean, they wanted to string him up because he was the only guy that survived out of his team, but they protected him until he got well enough to where he could get to help and, and get out of Afghanistan. So this concept was around. I think that's why Jesus told him this. It was interesting because right in the middle of all these things, he's telling them, don't do this, don't do this. He said, and by the way, when you find a house, stay there the whole time that you're there. So I was just thinking just from a practical illustration, Jesus has given them really good advice on what you do, uh, including the wipe and the, you know, knock the dust off your feet, which would mark this whole town for judgment if they weren't willing to listen. So I just yeah. thought it was some interesting, like practical things that he's telling them as well as like big picture stuff. Well, and you see the plan fulfilled starting in Acts two, where they went out, you know, there's the whole book of Acts. You know, once, once Jesus died and was buried and resurrected and the Holy Spirit was poured out, they became his witnesses. But I think he was, he was introducing this concept here that I, I'm going to use flawed people through my power to declare who I am to the world. That That is the marketing campaign <laughs> for, for who God is and his desire for people to be part of his forever family. So it's hard to get that perspective from here because, like we've said, this is early. This is the introduction. I mean, John the Baptist prepared the way, but Jesus is preparing the way. And now his chosen 12 are preparing the way. And then the next chapter, you have 72 preparing the way. And now he then, then he'll start introducing and predicting what he's going to do to accomplish the kingdom arriving. Yep. And so it, it, that's why I'm glad you read that verse in Luke 9, 27, because I realize there's a lot of disagreement on exactly what that meant when the kingdom would arrive, but it sure seems to support what we say when he says in verse 27, some of y'all are not going to taste death before you see the kingdom, you know, of God. So it then leads to verse seven, which I think the reason Luke did this, and, and Mark does the same thing, is this is difficult for these men to trust Jesus' mode of this is what the kingdom is going to be like. Because they're you got to think, they're thinking it's going to be a kingdom, and just like every other kingdom, that means we're going to take over the world, and a lot of people are going to die. We're going to end our enemy's threats. Because that was the... That was the kingdom definition. This is, you conquer other people. Now here Jesus is saying, I'm going to bring life. It, it just doesn't it, seem. It didn't even all, uh, enter their mind, Jace, that the temple of God 
would be utterly destroyed. He had to remind them. Not exactly. once Donald be left on top of another. They were thinking, well, I thought we was going to be the, the, king, the, 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 the ruler of the world here. Exactly. That's why they're arguing about who's going to be, in the, great, the, yep. be the greatest. So watch, in verse 7, it says, Now Herod the Tetrarch heard about all that was going on, and he was perplexed. Because some were saying that John had been raised from the dead, others that Elijah had appeared, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago had come to life. But Herod said, I beheaded John. Who then is this I hear such things about? And he tried to see him. So if you turn over and read Mark's account, you'll Hang see. Hang on before we do that, Jace. Let's take our last break. So if you go over to Mark's account, Mark 6, you see where he they're sent out in, in the second part of verse 6. Uh, he called in the 12, he sent them out in verse 7. And then same thing in verse 8, you know, here's your instructions. Uh, verse 12, I mentioned earlier that they went out and they told the people that they should repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil. So then when you get to Herod here, in verse 14, you get all the details. Because Herod, he was perplexed because, you know, the threat of the new kingdom, because here's John the Baptist going out saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near, ultimately was deemed a threat through manipulation from Herod's wife, which we're going to get into. And it, that threat was snuffed out to their kingdom because they cut his head off, which yeah. is the normal operating procedures in kingdoms that rise up and fall. But King Herod is perplexed because now it's like, well, I cut the head off, off the snake, and now you got this Jesus. So, so from his perspective, another, just another one has risen up. Now, who is this? Yep. And, and the fact that he thought it might be John the Baptist shows you that it's really bothered his conscience on what he did. And, and you see that in the story, and I'll read Mark's account in verse 14. Uh, Herod, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he's Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. He had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married, so his niece, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him. Knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, when Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, on the, in the opportune time when it came, on his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for the high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. And once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And here's really the moment, because you can tell already that the king likes John the Baptist. He's letting him out of prison. He's listening to him. He, yeah. he knows he's a holy man. That, that verse 21 is real key, you know. And But because of his oaths, the dinner guests, and, and he's not even taking into account his wife has manipulated their daughter. It, it's like a, for lack of a better word, you know, a Game of Thrones kingdom, horrible <laughs> type venture where he, he got played. His, his reputation is on the line. And so he didn't want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner 
with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Now, what a horrific story, but I think it shows you about doubts. You know, you have one instance where the disciples are obviously doubting this method of let's take nothing and go out there and tell people they need to repent. I don't think we're really giving that a fair thought. That that that's crazy. This yeah. is you think this is how we're going to become the most powerful people, you know, by doing these these miracles with total reliance. There's no wep what are the weapons and so then you have Herod who had an opportunity because he was, why was he perplexed by John the Baptist's message, I think is the question. What was making him him doubt what he thought was the way to true power? There was something about what John the Baptist was saying that was, that was causing him doubts to life and the meaning of life and and so you really see that. And uh, I heard a lesson by Tim Keller, which I think is amazing. I've never seen someone do a sermon about this story until I listened to it. But it really stopped me in my tracks. Because you think, you know, when it says he was a, he feared John, well, what was he? He wasn't scared. I mean, he's chained up. So what was it about him that was causing him to be fearful? Possibly he was speaking of another king and another kingdom. And it looked nothing like <laughs> anything he understood right. as as power. That's what I think on that. But I think it's a it's a great picture to show you, Jace, when people are in the political realm, they can't imagine there being any greater power than the power that they have. And of course any other, anything that's a threat to that power becomes a threat to them. But it's usually over stuff like this. It's it's um, palace intrigue stuff. I mean, there was no reason for John to die. This whole thing was a grudge by this woman that led to this whole scenario. This should have never happened, and yet it did. And I think it just shows you the surface level of where people are. But I think you're right. I think Herod, for the first time in his life, began to be touch below the surface and he's like maybe there is you know i mean the, his doubts were doubts that his way was the only way how you're so, still looking at you're still looking at a country that's wrestling with the king the possible king that will lead us all jesus the kingdom of god is here right. it's not not near it's here right. and out of that all these politicians running around up in Washington, D.C., they should fear that. Yeah. But well, they don't well, because they can't, they can't see past their own the position power. Of Herod. But, it, but it shows you that deep down they, yeah, do, that's they, it. they do have doubts. And that's the point Keller made, and that's the point I want to make. Because in the religious world, we, we think doubts is a negative thing. But actually when you start realizing what Jesus was doing here, Doubt, doubts are not necessarily negative. For, for the people who follow Jesus, that gives you an opportunity. Yeah. You know, when it said the opportune time came, that was where you got to make a decision. Are you going to do what's right, what you believe in your heart? Because he was asking the right questions about John the Baptist. He's like, why is he doing this? Why did he confront me about my sinful, what he called sinful array? Why would he do that? What What's he, what's, what is there to gain for him? And so in the back of his mind, he's thinking, maybe he is sent from God. Yeah. Why would any human being on the earth risk his life on what's going on in my bedroom? If the powers that be knew that Jesus had the opportunity, if he wanted it, to make himself the kingdom of the world. It seems like to me, if you were in an outside kingdom, whatever, what man-made construct instead of a God-made construct, you would run into some serious problems. It would make it would exactly. make you fearful, and that's why this story is so profound. Because in the in the at the end of this, he had a moment, and it showed you what you fear the most. He feared John the Baptist in a respectful way, but the whole reason he went along with this scheme 
that we all know is going to rip his family apart because the wife has manipulated the daughter to commit murder. Yep. Well, how's that going to work out 20 years down the road? They're going to have to live with this decision the rest of their life. Nightmares, guilt, shame. Stuff like that is, is still going on, Jace. And so when you really looked at his heart, he had a window of opportunity that we all have when we have doubts to make us study, research, have an open mind, you know, submit to the creator of the universe because he is right. And there is a, a draw for that. And he didn't do it. His greatest fear was what those guys thought about him. And he said, I've already given my word. And sounds like I, a true politician out of lack of the fear of embarrassment. He goes along with it. And look, you know what it did to him? It hardened his heart. And then you see him resurface. Uh, later on in the book of Mark, when Jesus, here's Jesus now, fast forward three years, and Jesus is standing before him, and, and you know, it's, it's, I know we're out of time, but when you read it, and we'll read it in the overtime, he mocks him, and he ridicules him. You say, why did he do it? That, that's, that's a hard heart. That's a guilty conscience. Yep. And he, he's, here he is again, wanting to cut the head of the snake off again to keep his power. Yeah, sliding into oblivion. All right, we're out of time, as Jay said, so we'll uh, we'll pick this discussion up in our overtime. Really interesting stuff uh, about Herod. If you want to follow us, blazetv.com slash unashamed is where we'll be. We'll see you in overtime. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube, and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.